us pray. Lord, would you, would you give us yourself? Just let us spend some time sitting with you, Lord. Thank you. So, so tell me if you had this experience. In my elementary school, I can remember waiting in the cafeteria line, and there was a big banner over the door as you're about to go into the food line, and it said, you are what you eat. Anybody else? Anybody else have that? There were days when I smelled the, the smell and I thought, I'm not sure this is going to be good. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to be what I'm about to eat. But that wasn't every day, but it happens sometimes. So you are what you eat was, was a little concept that, that the German materialist read as in not Christian, decidedly anti-Christian philosopher, uh, Forbox that he used. He said, the human being is simply what we eat. And Alexander Schmemann, arguably the leading Eastern Orthodox theologian in America from the 20th century, Schmemann, because he was an Eastern Orthodox Christian who easily believes that God moves and works in his created world and all the rest, Schmemann picked this up and sort of tweaks for a box with it, I mean, you know, long later, and then turns it around. He begins his book, For the Life of the World, Shmaimon's book about the Eucharist, he begins it by saying, man is what he eats. With this statement, the German materialist philosopher Feuerbach thought he'd put an end to all idealistic speculations about human nature. In fact, however, he was expressing, without knowing it, the most religious idea of man. And then what Shmema does is he retells, in paraphrase, the story of God creating us humans, of putting us in a beautiful and good world in which, yes, we're creatures with spirit, with heart that's meant to connect to others and to eternity, to God, but also we have appetites and desires and bodies, and that's real. And Shmema simply says, this is all meant to work together. And when we grow plants and we eat of the fruit of the earth and we are happy and full and healthy and whole, we're meant to give thanksgiving that God has made such a reality in which we live. And he tries to get it all back together. The key thing then for Shmaimon and the Eastern Orthodox is the living in thanksgiving. So these three Sundays of November that remain, we're going to spend a little time thinking about and hopefully maybe delighting in and wondering, having wonder towards giving thanks. That is towards Eucharist. The Eucharist, the word Eucharist is simply the Greek word for giving thanks, Eucharizo. So we're going to spend a little time thinking about giving thanks. This morning we'll set it up a little bit and mostly think about bread. Next week, Mother Wendy will help us think about mostly wine. And then the, the last Sunday of Thanksgiving will be Christ the King, and we'll think about how the remembering aspect of Eucharist helps us to remember and appropriate in ourselves how it is that Jesus became king. But that's for that week. For this week, we want to think a little bit about bread. Because Jesus gives us this very simple meal, if you want to say, a very symbolic level meal. There's a, there's a wonderful joke about these little wafers, and the joke, that many some of you know it, it, it goes, it takes more faith to believe that thing is bread than it does to believe it's the body of Christ. <laughs> Which is painfully true, isn't it? I mean, is this thing like, what, 80% wax and, you know, 20% something else? I don't know. Maybe we can do something about that later. Um, but we have this very simple meal of bread and wine. So, bread and wine. Why bread and wine? Well, the obvious answer, and a good one, is that's core food, right? For many cultures around the world, and maybe cultures where it isn't bread and wine, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's rice cake and rice wine or something. But for many cultures, bread and wine is core food. It's, you know, it's the Lord of the Rings. It's limbos bread. It's transferable. You can bake it and take it. And you can cork it and carry it on your camel, right? This is core food, core sustenance. So in a sense, it's that. 
and that's good. You know, sign me up. I, I love bread and all baked things. It's the hardest thing for me to do without. So I'm, I'm in for it, right? I'm, I love it. Uh, it's good, good stuff. But if you look in the scriptures, we find that, yes, it's all that, and it's even more. The first place that the word bread shows up is in Genesis chapter 3, in a quite painful situation. The humans have done the one thing they were asked not to do. They have become ashamed. They've gotten their, their hearts and minds are closed in on themselves, and they're hiding from each other, and they're hiding from God. And Jesus, or God, the Lord God, sorry, comes down to sort this out and says to Adam, the man, the man of the earth, he says, cursed be the earth because of you. By the sweat of your brow shall you eat bread. Now, you can eat everything else just fine. No. By the sweat of your brow will you do all the things you need to do to live. No longer will it be simple. No longer will the earth respond to you in a simple way and you will have all that you need because you don't deserve it anymore, and it can't trust you. By the sweat of your brow, will you toil and labor to make life work? Yes, in terms of bread, but in all kinds of ways. Bread is standing in for itself and more than itself. What about wine? The first place that wine shows up is in in Genesis chapter 9. So in Genesis And we get to this place where the Lord God looks and he sees that in the human, the only thought of their hearts is always evil all the time. The thoughts of their hearts are only evil all the time. And so he sends a flood to wash it clean and start over. And Noah is the the primary start over person. So after the flood, when they come out and they rejoice, then the Lord God resets covenant with Noah, and it's like, what, two sentences later that Noah is drunk on wine, and that leads to trouble, and that leads to a division in the, in the happiness of that new covenant that's been created. Wine, standing in for trouble, causing, in a sense, trouble, again, in a crucially important moment. Bread and wine, they speak of more than themselves. In a happier way, they continue to speak of more than themselves. The second occurrence of each one of them is Genesis 14, which is also the first occurrence of the two of them together. All right? A lot of, few, few Genesis stories with one more, so stay with me here. Abram, not yet Abraham. Abram has settled in the land and Lot's over there. And the regional kings get together and they do a raid and they haul off Lot and his family and all this stuff. So Abram gets his guys together, and they go, and they rescue them and bring them back. And Abram is met by this mysterious figure. His name is Melchizedek, which in Hebrew is king of righteousness. Who is he? Is he prefiguring Jesus, or is he Jesus making a sneak peek appearance? This is much debated, and we're not going to sort it out today. I don't know if anybody can really sort it out, to be honest, because he is a dude, if there's anybody in the Bible who has, how to put it, more impact for, for per, per word of text, right? He gets about that much story, and he has this incredible impact. He shows up, and he brings to Abraham bread and wine to somehow mark, to somehow celebrate, to somehow say things are restored. What does Abraham do? Abraham gives him a tenth of everything. So there's something hugely important going on here. In the wisdom literature in the Psalms, in Psalm 104, we're told that there's something really, really good about food. The Lord causes grass to grow, plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth. So we got that out of the way. Sustenance taken care of, food for the earth, and wine to gladden the heart, oil to make his face shine, bread to strengthen a person's heart. Wine and bread get heart attached to them. There's something about them that in the scriptures is understood, yes, to sustain us, but more than just sustain us, to make life wonderful to make it full, to make us whole. 
Perhaps this is why Jesus calls himself the bread of life. Perhaps this is why Jesus calls himself living bread that came down from heaven. So our gospel this morning in John chapter 6 is the moment, this, the single moment in the gospels when Jesus is willing to let them all walk, right? He offends them. He's, he's honest with them to the point that they get offended. He says, you know, you've all just flocked around to me because I, I gave you some free lunch. And there's more than that going on here. And he knows that he's going to die. And he knows that he's going to ask them to commit to following him, which is going to be difficult. And they all say, okay, what's that about? You know, you're, you're saying we're only here because we got a free lunch. And he says, you're going to have to eat my body. And they say, whoa, that's a bit much. And they all, they all start to argue with him. It's this really intense argument that happens. Jesus does not make it easier on them in that moment, right? In other words, this is important to Jesus. Whatever it is he's after is important here. He chooses to use the more difficult words of the words he might use. He uses a verb that's actually trogo. Do you hear that? It's, it's almost onomatopoeic, visceral, right? You're going to have to chew on me. And they're like, okay, that's gross. You know, really, he's, he's purposefully pushing this on them. This is real. You're going to you're gonna have to get me into you and take my sacrifice seriously. And Jesus, in that, word, in that moment, says, I'm the life that came down from heaven. And we need that. We need an infusion, if you will, or an ingestion, if you will, getting into the core depths of who we are, of life that we can't produce for ourselves, that came down from heaven and gives it to ourselves as gift, that gets into our full system every system and the wholeness of who we are. And Jesus, having incarnated himself, is part of, you know, the the biome and the stuff. And he's got a body that, you know, that has where skin dies on the edge and sloughs off and where he's 69% water or whatever and all that stuff of life. He's, he's, He's mushed himself into that. He's woven himself into that. So he's extending that to say, eat this bread, drink this cup, and yes, you remember me, and also more than just remember me. You bring me into yourself, and you bring this life into yourself. And whereas bread has stood for sustenance and more than sustenance, and whereas it was present at the moment where everything crashed, and it stood for the difficulties and challenges and pains of all aspects of life. So now Jesus as the living bread says, I'm bringing renewal and redemption and new life at the same depth. Yeah, it's about sustenance. It's about more than sustenance. It's about inner life and change and all aspects of life and having my life in yourself. Augustine put it in a beautiful way. That when we come forward to receive the body of Christ, we become the body of Christ. We already, we already are, but you get the point. It's a lovely image. When we come forward to receive the body of Christ, by having the body of Christ in us, we are what we eat. Shmaiman says, yeah, we are we, aren't we? So we eat the body of Christ and we become the body of Christ. When we come together, when we pronounce things, agree together, speak together, pray together, in humility, all come to the same table, partake, then we realize that we are the body of Christ. And when we come with our hands open, we are saying, there's nothing I could pay for this gift. There's no way I could pay enough for this gift. But also when we come with our hands open, we're also saying, you gave yourself for me. I offer myself to you. 
and we become the body of Christ. So Shmeiman was quite clever to turn that around, say, we are what we eat. A lot of times when you talk about Eucharist, people get nervous because they're afraid you're going to argue about, is it transubstantiation or consubstantiation or this substantiation or that substantiation? And half the people in the room are, I don't even know what substantiation is. And what we're saying here is, just thank you, Lord, that there is substantiation. Thank you that you became incarnate. Thank you that you took on flesh, became substance, offered yourself for the life of the world, and offer yourself to us. So let's just take a moment, take a breath, and uh, invite you just to just to settle in in your own heart and mind with the Lord. And Eucharist comes from the Greek verb eucharizo. Eucharizo simply means I give thanks. So in your own heart and mind, just say eucharizo to the Lord. Just say, Lord, I give you thanks. Thank you, Lord, for the life of yourself, for us and for the world. 